Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Jeff, Mm -hmm. how are you doing today? Oh, I'm not not so bad. Um, How about yourself? Jeff, I am doing amazing oh yeah oh yeah i heard you got some pretty good news yes so as of a couple days ago mm-hmm. i paid off my house All I do is house 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 no matter what, what mortgage we we bought our house just over four years ago like we've only had the house for like four four years and two months mm-hmm. i think and when we got the house, we got, it was a 15 year mortgage, which already is like, you know, a lot of people, at least back in the day would get like, oh, a 30 year mortgage or whatever. Yeah. Um, when we got our mortgage though, we, we still intended to pay extra on it and we were hoping to get it paid off within, you know, maybe 10 years at some point after a couple of years had passed and we were making good progress. We thought, let's try to get it paid off in five years in January when we had to get our, uh, furnace replaced. I was really upset at that because I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm not, we're not going to be able to make the five year deadline. We're probably going to have to wait until the following year. Mm-hmm. And um, not to say that the quarantine is not awful and that the, you know, stuff the, that everybody's been dealing with has been, not to say that it hasn't been bad, but the quarantine financially actually worked out for us pretty well because we weren't eating out as much. Right. I wasn't driving as much for work. Mm hmm. And I was actually making more money on unemployment than I would at my job. Right. That's, which is real bonkers. It, it, it is. Yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, the end result is we actually like, be, we don't have to pay off our furnace yet. We have, if as long as we pay it off by next January, there's no interest on it. So I realized like I could just pay off. I could, it, it, we almost a few, like a month ago, we almost had enough money to just completely pay off the house. And so I just, I kept an eye on it. I kept an eye on it. I called the bank to find out exactly what the process would be, Mm -hmm. found out what it was. And uh, two days ago, as of this recording, we sent in our final check and the house is ours. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like it's, it blows my mind. Like that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's really good. I'm so excited about this. That day I had to drive to work and I was I was driving to work and I was at, uh, I was getting myself some, some fast food on the way. And I thought to myself, you know, I deserve a milkshake. Darn it. So I got myself <laughs> a milkshake. <laughs> I see, you know, I say that, I say that to myself all the time. Yeah. I deserve a milkshake. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. So I am, I'm very excited about that. Um, I would say thank you to our patrons. I guess thank you to our patrons, but patrons rest assured that the Patreon has not meaningfully impacted uh right yeah, my, no, he's... my house but i have not yet paid myself for anything right I've, yeah <laughs> i've paid back stuff that i've bought for the podcast and that's it yeah but still thank thank everybody thank listeners thank you patrons thank you everybody for the moral support that right. you have provided simply by being there i really appreciate it yeah yeah like you know you've been able to do a thing that you like doing and while also being able to pay off your house i don't know i, I it, you know yes they're not exactly connected but it's sure. you know you having a, having a good hobby makes you feel good which helps you get through the rest of your life and the rest of your life is what part of the rest of your life is paying off your house so yeah so yeah, so thanks so. everybody yes thank you thank you all so much um <laughs> just for being there i'm i'm so excited it's awesome mm-hmm. um anyway so you want to go ahead and get into this episode sure okay um jeff i want you to imagine that Let's imagine that you've bought a house. Okay. And you get it paid off and you're excited. You decide to to celebrate and you're going to, I don't know, remodel some stuff in the basement. And when you're moving some stuff around in the basement, you notice that there's a there's a little, uh, one of the tiles on the floor is loose. Hmm. And you think to yourself, oh, of course, you know, the moment you get the house paid off, <laughs> of course, something is going to go wrong. Right, yeah. And so you go and you lift it up to, I don't know, put some adhesive or something under it. And you notice that there actually isn't, like you you lift it up and there's like a space underneath it. Ooh. So what do you do? Uh, I'm going to 
Oh, shine a flashlight down there. Okay. Um, they actually look like there are handholds leading down. Oh. And it goes on further than you can see with your flashlight. Oh, all right. Well, uh, yeah, I'll just go on down there. <laughs> okay. So you you head on down there. And do you still have your flashlight on or did you turn it off? Uh, yeah, I'll have it on. You still have it on and it. you notice that there's, uh, just from the, the light bouncing around wherever, you begin to notice some like... Some flickering of, of looks like maybe gold, maybe Ooh. like red flickerings, green flickerings. And so you, you, you know, you pick up your flashlight again, you, you shine it down in the direction it's coming from and you realize there is a giant pile of gold and a giant pile of treasure in this basement. What? Jeff. And as you notice the large decayed skeleton of a, a scaled beast lying atop the pile of gold. Mm. You realize why you got this house so cheap. <laughs> and that's because it was buried. It was that's because it was built on an ancient dragon burial ground. Oh, okay. <laughs> However, where there's an ancient dragon burial ground, you know what else there is, Jeff? Where, where what is it? <laughs> there is a dragon's horde. The ancient bear, dragon bear of the ground. I feel like that would actually raise the price of the of the house. If right, like, oh yeah, there there might be treasure underneath this. House. Well, you know, may, maybe they maybe they think it's cursed or something, or maybe it is yeah, still maybe. cursed. Maybe if I, if I grab that treasure, then then I'll be like a skeleton <laughs> in moon in in the in the in the moonlight or whatever. Sure. Anyway, so today's dragon sword item was submitted by Potato Plunderer via Discord. And this item is the Tome of Treasures. Mm. It's a uh, fairly simple item, but uh, I, I thought you know it kind of fits the kind of fits the theme so far. Sure. This is a very rare, wondrous item. It is an ancient book containing rites that will bring the reader wealth and fortune. If mm. you spend forty-eight hours over a period of six days or fewer studying the book's contents and practicing its guidelines, you are given a map which only you can see to a location where a powerful adversary of the DM's choice is guarding a hoard of riches worth up to 1d8 plus 2 times 1,000 gold, so hmm. between 3,000 and 10,000, and three magical items from the magic item table on page 147. Sorry, magic item table G on page 147 of the Dungeon Master's, the Dungeon Master's Guide. Whether these riches are created by magical means or are taken from somewhere else in the world, is up to the DM's discretion. Huh. And that's it. You know, it's like I said, it's fairly simple. It's you read this book, you do what it tells you, and then after 48 hours of studying this book, you see or you make or you procure a map that leads to a monster and treasure. Okay. The monster may be an orc. The treasure may be a pie. Who knows? <laughs> the treasure may but, be a pie. Yeah, but... I like, I really like the last sentence, whether these riches are created by magical means or are taken from somewhere else in the world is up to the DM's discretion. So mm. it might be like when I first read this, I was thinking like, oh yeah, it just you figure out where a buried treasure is. But the last sentence very much makes this seem like, no, it is creating, it is in some way magically bringing the treasure to you. The treasure wasn't there before you read this book. Sure. Okay. Maybe it's conjuring up the treasure. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is just, you know, sucking a dungeon out of a cave somewhere and plopping it down near you. Right. It's up to the DM. Huh. Kind of makes me think of the, the, the what was it? The bag of magic beans or whatever, where you create a, uh, <laughs> where you might accidentally create a, um, a mummy lord's uh, lair. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, among many other things. Right, and this could be sort of like that, where it like it like it, yeah, it, it kind of it kind of brings up some sort of like the, like the the adversary could be a really nasty monster that would have, you know, w it would have been perfectly fine left alone, but now that you've conjured it with this item, is you know, is wreaking havoc somewhere, and that's where the treasure is coming from because that that thing is going around stealing it, or yeah. Or it could be that the treasure is like just sort of it. It is bits and pieces from all over the world or whatever. And it's just kind of like, well, I need this treasure for this magic thing going on. So it just kind of like, I don't know, like teleports or however, you know, just random treasure. So you like, you have this pile of treasure yeah, and you're like, 
selling it and using it to trade for things and then suddenly somebody recognizes it. it's like wait a minute that's like that's my great aunt's like amulet or whatever <laughs> yeah that I was could like no be. it was that's in a good he was like no it was in a it was in a dungeon somewhere it's like where it's like my my, my aunt never went over there she her it was locked in a. It was locked in her safety deposit box or something. I don't know. We even put a golem in front of it to keep it safe, and the golem's gone too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, you mean this golem? You hold up its head or something? <laughs> right. Uh, um, yeah, I I think that like there's there's a couple ways that this could be a really neat adventure hook. Mm-hmm. Um, there could be like oh, this town just has like this giant dungeon nearby that has been there for years and years there's rumors of the dungeon getting bigger every now and then and you find out it's because somebody in the town has this book and because it doesn't say the book can only be used once so they've Hmm. basically just been spending the last I don't know 50 years 100 years whatever reading this book and then each time they do it adds on to the dungeon outside the town Hmm. so that's, that's one way another way is you're on an adventure you're in a dungeon you get to the room where the, you know, the fabled uh, golem is and has a <laughs> grandma's treasure behind it. And then you get to the room and it's gone. Yeah. It's just, it's just it's like, like just, just a big empty room. Yeah. Or it's just like a, just a wall. Like you open a door and it's all like filled in. Sure. Yeah. That, I don't know. Yeah. That could be really interesting. Yeah. So like, I, I love the idea. I think that without that last sentence, this is a fairly lackluster item, but with that last sentence, it's got so much potential. I think it's really cool. Oh yeah. And I think we talked about it a couple episodes ago with the, um, uh, there was the, the summoners to- or the, the, the fiend folio, I think is what it was called. Mm-hmm. The tome that like summons a, a demon or whatever. Mm. I like when the players can, when they are in control of, okay, we are going to go fight a monster. You know, we, we have the means to make the monster appear. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to go fight it. Mm-hmm. I like that as an idea for a part of a campaign, either, either the main thrust of the campaign or a side plot or whatever. Yeah. I like when the players are directly in control of when there is going to be adventure. Yeah, sure. So, and this, this would very much facilitate that. Yeah. Cause it's like, it, it gives, it gives the, the DM, like the DM will know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. because the the players are telling the DM what's going to happen. So the DM yep. knows what to plan. And then also the players have agency and feel in control. So like, they're like, okay, cool. We're, we're doing what we want to do. Yeah. And the DM doesn't have to work as hard. So yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> right. it's kind of a win win when, when that happens. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's, that's pretty good. And so I, I like this item. I think this is a, this is a really neat one. Mm-hmm. So I think that'll do it for uh, the Dragon's Horde for today. Once again, that was the Tome of Treasures from Potato Plunderer. Thank you very much, Potato Plunderer. Jeff, if anybody else wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde, or if they wanted to submit questions for us to discuss, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, or the Retirement Village, how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at innerpartyconflict at gmail.com, or join us on our Interparty Discord at bit.ly slash discord. That's correct. And before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. As usual, we're giving away a copy of Unearth Tips and Tricks Volume 1, courtesy of Crit Academy. It is a supplement from the Crit Academy podcast where it contains uh, 25 character concepts, 25 encounter concepts, 25 monster variants, 25 magic items, 25 player tips, and 25 DM tips, all taken from that podcast. So it's a, it's a great supplement. It's got tons of ideas in there. I helped write it, so I have a I have particular stake in in reminding everybody that this is a great product. <laughs> uh-huh. So, uh, so Jeff, who is our winner of this great product today? Today's winner is Tori R. Whoa, 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 winner! Gobble, gobble, gobble! Yes, congratulations, Tori R. And I do want to say that uh, Tori R. sent a picture of a cute rat Aww. in in the email that they sent. <laughs> and bit of a tangent. We just got a couple cute baby rats. Oh, baby rats. Congratulations. Yes. Anyway, sorry. I'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> Congratulations, Tori R. You should be getting that in your email pretty soon uh, within the next few days. If you don't get it within a week, let me know. And be sure to leave Crit Academy a review. Um, if you leave them a review on DMs Guild, Drive Through RPG, or whatever, um, then it can help them get some additional uh, viewers, get them, you know, more people to check out their great products. And also it can let them know how to make better products in the future. So be sure to leave them a review, whether, whether it's good or bad, hopefully it's good, but you know, tell them what you think. 
And Jeff, if anybody else wanted to enter this drawing, if they wanted to be like Tori R and they wanted to win a copy of this great supplement, how would they do so? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with unearthed tips and tricks in the subject line. Yes. And pictures of cute rats in the body are not mandatory. <laughs> However, they are appreciated. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we actually had to uh, had to um, cut out of part of the recording a little while ago because I had to go. I had to go welcome in the baby rats that we just got. We yeah. got <laughs> we got two baby rats. We have not had rats in a couple of years. And uh, these two rats, they're two boy rats, and we are naming them Mark and Jeremy. Mark and Jeremy. What is that? Well, so, I mean, first off, it, it is a reference to um, the TV show Peep Show, which is where Superhands got his name oh, from. Oh, okay. Yep. So we now have the three main characters of Peep Show. Sure. But also, the idea of a pet with a human name... <laughs> is just endlessly amusing to me. So a, a rat named Mark. Right. That's just, yeah. I'll never turn down that opportunity. <laughs> so uh so yeah, anyway, anyway, sorry. Big tangent there, but I probably <laughs> will leave that in the episode. <laughs> Um, next up, I want to thank all of our wonderful patrons. I mentioned uh, the patrons earlier, but for anybody who's not who's not familiar with what Patreon is, Patreon is an online platform. You can pledge to donate a certain amount of money per month to the creator of your choice. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. On there, we've got a few different reward tiers. So if you want to donate a, even as little as a dollar a month, you get outtakes, you get access to our, um, we've got fantasy fiction up there. I've been turning some of those fantasy fictions into audio format so you can listen to them as well. Um, on the next tier up at $5, we've got a monthly bonus podcast, which uh, we've been meaning to record for a while. Hopefully by the time this one goes out, we will have one of those for uh, for June. Yeah. No promises though. Uh, and then uh, up on the top tier, we've got a Roll20 game every month. And uh, the day after we record this, we're going to be playing our Roll20 game for this month, so by the time this goes out, it will have already passed. But hopefully, you know, if that interests you, you can join us for for next time. So if you want to help out the show and get some cool stuff in return, go to patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. Check out the rewards, see if anything appeals to you, and consider helping out the show. And of course, thank you to all of our patrons who have continued to support us during the, the difficult times everybody's going through recently. We know that, you know, your your money is more valuable than than... Uh, it may have been in the past, so mm-hmm. we really appreciate that you are continuing to support us. Yes, thank you. All right, and then one more thing. Check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy. I mentioned them for uh, the Honor Tips and Tricks supplement. They are a great podcast where Justin, Ian, and Brandon create new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. Also check out Brute Force and Ignorance. They are an actual play podcast on the network. And also check out D&D Character Lab. They're not making episodes anymore, but they uh, made characters every week and pitted them against each other to debate whose characters were better. Uh, Enough with all that. Let's get into some questions, Jeff. All right. Our first question comes from Bikanshma. I think that's that's what that is. On Reddit. And they ask, why do we still have both ability scores and ability bonuses? Yeah. um, So I'll just get this right out there. I don't know. We can try and figure out a reason. I have a couple thoughts on it. Okay. I mean, I mean, the the obvious one is it might just be like it's a holdover thing, you know. Yeah. I for obviously there was more reasons for it in earlier editions or something. But sure. I know, like in fifth edition, they still use strength to calculate, uh, like I think carry weight and all that. Yeah. I mean, that's already, that's always been a thing with strength is like they, they calculate how much you can carry, how much you can push and lift and all that. And that's all calculated off of the ability score. I, I'm pretty sure that's still the case. Yeah. Um, And then um, I think your jump distance is also that like you're, if you have a running jump, you can jump your, you can jump a distance of your score. Yeah. Um, I figure that's, you know, that could be a reason, but at the same time, I feel like. They could very easily make it just, you know, if your if your modifier is this, you can jump this, and so right, on yeah, and so on. Like, I, yeah, if your modifier is, you know, plus three, then you can jump. You, know, you can jump five times. To- you know, you can jump a square for every pl- for every. I don't know. Uh, yeah, like I, I, my personal belief is that it's just a holdover from earlier editions. Mm-hmm. maybe you know in first edition maybe they were cribbing it from some other mechanic in some war game at the time i don't know but if there was a you know if they 
needed to get across, oh, you you need to know your your carrying capacity. They could make a specific chart just for that. Yeah. And having to learn one chart would probably be a lot easier than having every one of the six stats have a completely redundant number. You know what there, I mean? There is another reason okay. that I think that it might be. And it's more just like, it's just more uh, staggering progression. Okay. So like it's, you don't get like when you go up a point in strength, you don't go up a point in your strength bonus. It's yeah. every two. So I, I feel like it might just be some form of balancing or a way to kind of like slow down the progression so that it's, that you're not like, so that the numbers aren't getting so high so fast. Yeah. I feel like in, in, you know, I, in older edition or in like a third edition or maybe even in fourth edition where you're getting like, you know, ability bonuses way more often than in yeah. fifth edition. I feel like it's, it makes less sense there than it does in fifth edition. Like it may, I feel, I feel like it might make more sense that we have both ability score and bonuses in fifth edition than we do in the older editions. Sure. Cause be, because it's sort of staggering those numbers a little bit. So you're not, because you're only dealing with up to a plus three weapon, like the numbers are so much smaller in fifth edition. It's better to keep, you know, um, it, it's better to keep it so that like you, you have to, you have to choose, okay, do I point, do I put both of my points into strength and get another bonus? Or do I put one bonus of one point into strength and then one point into deck so I can get a bonus in decks. And the next time I up my ability score, I can get the strength again. You know, it's, 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 it's making you think a little bit more about where you're putting your points, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I guess that that is potentially an explanation, but again, like I feel like that, that might just be a side effect rather than a reason because mm-hmm, how mm-hmm. often in fifth edition, do you get a plus one to a stat? Right. I mean, like, Every four levels or whatever, you can you can put a plus one in two different stats, but you're still getting two points. I feel like no one would really necessarily bat an eye if it was every four levels, you just increase your one of your modifiers by one. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can choose to split it in half, but I feel like most people are only going to do that because they already have an odd score. Right. So I don't know. Like, you know, it, it could be... It's like you have two odd scores. That way you can up the bonuses of two abilities. Yeah. In one in one go. I don't, I don't know. know. It's it's kind of like a chicken and egg scenario. Yeah. Like, did it start with one or did it start with the other? I'm not really sure. I personally, my assumption is that it's a holdover and there are probably enough people who, they probably, I'll say, they probably play tested getting rid of them at some point and enough play testers were like, eh, it just doesn't feel like D&D to me. Right. Yeah. That's, that is a big thing. Like yeah. it's like, if it, if it doesn't feel, if it's not the same, it doesn't feel the same. Uh, I, that kind of reminds me of the thing with, I think it was, was it Macy's? I don't know. It was some, some big department store or something that used to like have sales all the time mm-hmm. for their, uh, for their, for, for their products. And people would go in like clip coupons or whatever and go in for the sales. Right. And then they were like, you know what we're going to do? We're instead of just doing sales, we're just going to lower all of our prices to the sale prices so that you're like, you're like, instead of like people waiting for the sale for this one item, we're just going to have everything be at sale prices all the time. And that's just our normal prices now. And people are like, no, we don't. What? No, I'm not going to shop there. It's not on sale anymore. Yeah. (laughs) They lost money because people weren't going in because they weren't excited about a sale. Yeah. You know, it's like people want that strength of 20. I don't want sure. plus five strength. My, my strength though, it's five, you know, maybe it could just be a bigger number is just more fun. You know, yeah. uh, we, um, Gabe and I had a, uh, had a teacher, uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> had a teacher that, uh, would basically like he would, he would grade us in like thousands of points, you right. know, like he would the you would you would add several zeros onto a score for for an assignment or something just for the heck of it and it was especially jarring because i had another teacher at the time who you would get like you would have an extra credit assignment and it's like oh that whole assignment was worth 2 points right 
And so, yeah, d- two different approaches. And that, yeah, I, I think I've heard that referred to as like pinball numbers or like the mm-hmm. pinball approach. Because in pinball, you know, you hit the ball once and you get a thousand points. And then you hit right. a thing and you get like 10, 10 million points or whatever. Yeah. It's like, what's the, what's the three zeros for? You know, like, yeah. they're, they're not, they're, they're unnecessary. <laughs> right. But, but there is are. definitely a, a psychological, you know, advantage. Like there is a, 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 that dopamine hit you get from seeing bigger numbers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I say that, I think it's just a holdover from earlier editions. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily mean that as a, a, a bad thing or something that right. has no advantage to it. Um, I just think that, yeah, people probably liked it in earlier editions and now they still want that same level of, of, of dopamine or whatever from seeing those big numbers. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I think, I think you're right that it's just like, it, it like m- changing it would be too much of a change and people would be like, that's oh, not D and D anymore. Or they like, they ruined it or something, you know, mm-hmm. fine. And I feel like having those two numbers does give you more, might give them more options to do different things with, um, like class abilities and stuff. So if they like okay. come out with uh future archetypes for classes, you know, they might like, if they want to make something that's a little bit more unique, they could be like, Oh, it goes off of your score instead of your ability, you know, instead of your modifier mm-hmm. or something, you know, like I feel like there's, a, it gives them a few more tools to, to work with, you know, more, more numbers that you can use when you're creating new spells or abilities or something. Yeah. So I don't know. No, yeah. no, no. I, I don't know why we still have both, but mm. I, I think that if they wanted to get rid of ability scores and just have ability modifiers, they very much could. Yeah. But I imagine there are a lot of people that would say it doesn't feel like D and D. Yeah. You know? Okay. Our next question comes from save the Junimos on Reddit. And they ask, do you think having too many rare player races makes everyone's race more bland? Yeah. So, so imagine, you know, when you've got in fifth edition, you've got in the player's handbook, you got the standard, standard races. You got humans, you got elves, halflings, dwarves, uh, half elves, half orcs, I suppose. Then you've also got, um, I guess gnomes could be thrown in there too. You've also yeah. got in the player's handbook, tieflings, you've got dragonborn. Yep. In the various, uh, you know, side books, you've also got tabaxi, you've got Aarakocra, You've mm-hmm. got uh, lizard folk, you know, turtles, turtles, so many, yeah. so many additional races that are like monstrous, monstrous. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the question is, do you think having all of these other options that maybe play pay a little bit of lip service to, oh, this is a rare race. You know, you won't see very many PCs of this, but that doesn't mean players can't play them. So does mm-hmm. do you think that? Having all of these monstrous races, having all of these these races that are like, you know, obviously supernatural in some way and so on and so on. Does that make player races as a whole, does that make them a bit less interesting because now everything is is crazy and when everything's crazy, nothing is crazy? Mm, I feel like it can. It, mm-hmm. it, it can do that, yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't have to like it, it. That doesn't have to be the case in every campaign or in every adventure, but sure. It can definitely, that can definitely happen. Um, I mean, you, you've, you've said before that you're not super duper fond of dragonborn. Yeah. And kind uh, of for this reason, I feel yeah. like when I'm picturing like, Oh, an, the average village are probably, you know, yeah, there are going to be some uh, mostly humans are probably going to be some elves, some dwarves, some gnomes, halflings, whatever. And yeah. then like, for them to see a, an adventuring party that's like, oh yeah, a bunch of dragon people walking around, and and to treat that like it is, if they are less rare, to treat mm-hmm. them like they are less rare, does kind of feel weird to me because I feel like the the average commoner is should be surprised when they see a character like that. Yeah, I like guess. if a if a town that has never seen a dragonborn before, uh, you know, if you're if the adventuring party goes in there and you're dragonborn paladin or whatever walks into the general store like are yeah. they gonna what are they gonna do like well, uh can i help you or is are they gonna scream and run you know like <laughs> right maybe that maybe that town has been attacked by a dragon before and sure and they're like shoot it's it's one of them you know um 
it, it's tough for the DM to decide like, do I make a big deal out of this or do we just kind of gloss over it because it's gonna it's gonna get in the way of the rest of the story or the yeah. rest of the characters. Like the other players have to wait uh, wait for the world to react to their party to their party member. Sure. Before they can do anything, you know, it's like every time we walk into a new town, we have to help. Oh, it's all about John Johnny Silver Scales over here. <laughs> but then let's say there's a campaign where Johnny Silver Scales is the, you know, the ostensibly the most usual of the PCs. You've got Johnny Silver Scales, but then you've also got, you know, uh, uh, Lizzie McLizard folk over there. <laughs> and then you've got Cat uh, Stevens and you've got... <laughs> Um, you know, birdie, the Aarakocra <laughs> flying around. Right. Then, then that makes, uh, you know, the Johnny silver scales look, you know, perfectly acceptable by comparison, but mm -hmm. then doesn't, you know, the question is, doesn't that kind of cheapen the dragonborn? And right. then by extension, everybody else is just yeah. like, oh, we don't even pay attention to them. They don't even mm -hmm. register because they're just human or elf or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. Elves and dwarves is like, that's just like, that's so boring like yeah. what like who does that anymore no we got we got all these other we have this whole menagerie of you know all these different playable races and stuff yeah yeah I, when, when i think about running something i'm always like i'm always like i want people to be able to do whatever they want like to play whatever they want obviously mm -hmm. i want them to sure. like if they have if they're excited about like i'm ex I, like i get excited about playing a warforged or a turtle or something because i think they're cool and then yeah. like so i get excited about playing them but like, so if I ever ran something, I wouldn't want to turn somebody down from playing something they're excited about playing. But it, like it, at at that point, you'd really would just have to make it like, well, in this world, there's everything everywhere. Everybody knows what everything is and no one gets excited, you know? Like, yeah. and, and then at that point, then it's, it's not fun. Sure. You know, like, cause part of the fun of at least, at least for some people, part of the fun of playing those weird races is being the like the odd man out like they yeah. want to be they want to people want like some you know people are going to want that attention you know that's that's fun to them mm -hmm. so it's yeah it's a hard thing to juggle um because like you could like limit the races that people use you can you know you can very easily say oh okay just only player's handbook easy enough you know yeah and it's like and that's and that's acceptable you know like as as a as a player i can accept that and be like all right fair enough like you know there's there's so many like there's so many ways to to unbalance the game by mixing and matching things from other books, even if it's all by wizards they're you know, sure. It's, you know, it's different. It can be different writers and they can have different things on their mind. Um, I guess I, I didn't really, I was sort of arguing the devil's advocate kind of just a minute ago when I was talking about this, like I do think to answer the question, I do think that yes, it kind of does, but I don't think it's the problem that it, it, it doesn't have to be a problem. Right. Um, like you were saying, Jeff, I wouldn't ever want to discourage someone from playing the race that they want to play. Um, when I do, if I ever do say like to my players, Hey, I don't really like Dragonborn. I will only say that. So to say, don't expect very many other Dragonborn. You can be a Dragonborn if you want, just don't expect there to be a ton of other Dragonborn in the, the game world, because I do kind of want the game world to treat Dragonborn as if they are fairly rare. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that an argument could be made that if having rare races makes the standard races more bland, the argument could be made that, well, maybe you need to use the standard races better. You know, yeah. if, if a human is boring, then that's because you don't really know how to use a human except in a boring way. And the, your only way of making them less boring is by, is by prohibiting anything that is more interesting. <laughs> Um, well, I think with the core, like the standard core races, like the, your elves, humans, dwarves, mm -hmm. what have you, like they have, they have like a bigger, richer history yeah. and I mean, not richer, but like more expansive. Sure. So like, you know, like you have several kingdoms of elves and, and many kingdoms of, of, uh, you know, of humans and they've all been at war once in a while, you know, like each one has been at war with another at one time or another. And so you have all this, whereas like the rare, more rare races are usually like smaller civilizations or ones that are more remote or, you know, or they have like, you know, they're more uh, secretive with their culture and things like that. So like sure. they might be more interesting, but they're more, there it's it's more in one place you know it's more um 
you know it's like it like it's kind of it's kind of more one it can be more one note because like the the older races have like many different like sub races like you know there's mm-hmm. there's like two different kinds of du- there's like i think just in the core in the in the main book there's like two different types of dwarves there's two different types of uh gnome uh there's two, two different, different types, types of halflings of halfling yeah. um i think there's like three different types of elf i don't i can't remember i think so there's like forest elves moon elves and drow i think yeah so like you got you you know there is there is a lot of variety there's more variety in them mm-hmm. um just off the bat so like you, you can you can make them interesting cuz like the the newer the newer races at least most of them like they've only they haven't been around that long like you've seen them here and there maybe like uh in older editions they might have added them into a book here you know but like i don't know there's i i just i feel like there's not as much to the to the rare races so like they're i agree the the um, thing that is exci- exciting about them is it's more it's more one note yeah i i think that um the, the problem is that the the rarer races the only thing that people know them for is that they're rare right yeah so and so that's what they're going to put their value in so that's why everything else seems less valuable because they don't have the rarity but what you should be doing is you should be focusing on how to make those newer races those rarer races more interesting intrinsically so that it's not necessarily about how rare they are it's about oh their society is like this so that character is going to play their character like this Mm. now um i've i've said many times we just talked about it a minute ago that i'm not a huge fan of dragonborn one would think that i dislike tieflings for the same reason (laughs) but i actually love tieflings because i personally have have reworked their history to to be something that i really really like Mm, mm -hmm. i imagine i could do the same thing with dragonborn i just haven't yet right yeah yeah making them fit into your world you know in a more organic way Mm -hmm. would would we it it would help them blend in more with the with the with the you know the core races absolutely so yeah like it's yeah, it's definitely a problem, but it it I don't I don't think it can be I don't think it's unsolvable. Yeah, so. I I think it's it looks like a problem to an inexperienced DM, and I mean it is it is a problem to an unexper- inexperienced DM. However, um, it's a it's a problem that can be fixed if you are willing to fix it. Mm-hmm. You know, just familiarize yourself with the race and try to integrate them more into the world, so that to the players it's not oh my entire character is that I'm a weird race right you know? yeah yeah you don't yeah you don't want you don't want to you don't want it to turn into that because sure I don't know. like if, the... if your if your character concept begins and ends with i'm a lizard folk <laughs> that's a problem that's a problem whether whether lizard folk are rare or not <laughs> you know uh our next question comes from n zero seven five three w Oh wait! Oh, you know, I thought that was—I thought that was someone I know, but no, I was thinking of N zero seven five two W. Oh yeah, sorry. Or not Sue? Maybe if if we're doing Leet. Sure, Jeff. Not Sue. Not Sue. <laughs> not not so. Like not S- so. S-E-W. Not so. Yeah, not so. Maybe that's oh, it. Oh, saying ain't so. <laughs> this was on Reddit, and they and they ask. How do you rationalize PCs carrying around weapons that would be way too big and cumbersome? So yeah. my, so say my, you know, uh, my paladin with a giant war hammer. It's like, yeah, you're going to just carry that thing around all day. Yeah. Um, um, I think when they asked this question, they were specifically talking about just, you know, stock standard weapons. I think they, they referenced the pike specifically because yeah. historically a pike is like a 10 foot long oh, yeah. stick with a, you know, point on the end. Right. Um, but I, I also imagine this should apply to, you know, your your clouds strife and such that have a <laughs> yeah. weapon that is as big as that, you know, just like a big giant slab of iron that's hanging around on their back. Right. Yeah. I mean, like in a lot of times it's mostly just going to be people flavoring it that way. But I mean, yeah. still, like if you're, you know, if you're trying to be somewhat realistic, which, you know, we always caution, we always caution that. Yeah. Then, you know, don't don't try to go too realistic. It's a game. Yeah. Um, I mean, because you're 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 thinking about the fantasy is based off of like medieval sort of fantasy stuff, mm-hmm. where you got 
knights with big shields and armor, you know, big heavy armor and like, like a giant bastard sword or something like that. And like, yeah. you know, they don't just walk around with that. They have like squires and like, you know, they okay. don't go, they don't, they don't walk into war. They don't like walk out their house fully dressed for war and go and just, you know, <laughs> go down to the field and start fighting. But what if they you know, did? <laughs> right. <laughs> they go to war you know like they march single file with a caravan and carts and stuff all like you know carrying all of their gear with them you know it's like yeah. or it's all packed on like pack mules or things like that and like while that might be fun to some to figure that stuff out in a D campaign it's like oh yeah we all have pack mules or we have a squire or something that'll carry all of our stuff or mm-hmm. i mean obviously there's the you know back of holding sure thing it's like yeah that you know that works but i think this is more specific to like yeah like a like a pike is this giant you know stick yeah like you're not gonna just walk into like yep i i i my my weapon on my character sheet is a pike it is a is a plus two to attack and damage or whatever Mm -hmm. and i'm gonna go walk into this shop right now (laughs) like (laughs) it's like i don't think you're gonna fit that through the door sir you know yeah it's so like you kind of have to wait. You got to wave it, I guess, in, in most cases. Yeah, th- there's a couple different approaches for this. Um, mm-hmm. Number one, I think most players, most players, most groups, most DMs are just going to just hand wave it and just not even think about it. Like, right. sure, in combat you have a pike. However, we're not going to worry about the the logistics of getting a 10-foot weapon through this, whatever. It's just don't worry about it. Just play the game. Just have fun. When you get into combat, you've just got your weapon out. However, that works. I would say most groups are going to do that. Another way to look at this is your characters have ostensibly, hopefully, been using these weapons for a very long time. They're proficient. They've, you know, depending on their backstory, they've been probably been an adventurer for some time. They probably spent years training to use that weapon or other weapons or whatever. Mm -hmm. So... You can rationalize it as my character has been carrying around this giant sword for, you know, five or six years. He's gotten used to the, just the subtle movements necessary. Yes, he he leans down a little bit whenever he goes through a door because yeah. <laughs> the first year and a half he kept bumping the, his sword into the door frame every time he went home. <laughs> so you can rationalize it as. No, no, we don't need to worry about that because my character has already gone through that. It's not interesting to the game. We can just assume he's figured it out. Uh, A a third approach is you could make this part of the game. You could maybe have the players make checks at certain points, you know, when (laughs) when there is like they just squeeze through a narrow part of a cave or something, have them explain how they are taking off their sword and how they're, you know, dragging it behind them or whatever. You can do that. The problem a lot of the reason a lot of people don't is because that is probably not interesting or fun. Yeah. If you think it will be, go ahead and do it. But do, if it ends up not being fun, don't do it just for the sake of realism. Cuz again, yeah. you can just assume that they've figured out the best way to transport their gear when they've been doing this for years. I feel, I feel like if you add more ways to like take away the thing that a character does. Yeah. It's like if, if I made this character cause I wanted him to be this cool guy that uses a pike. Like I thought that was, I just really like that mental image and I think it's cool and I want to yeah. do that. And like, and then, and then you start throwing things at me like, Oh, okay. Well, you're going to go through this narrow thing. What are you going to do with your pike? You got to leave it behind. You're going to, what are you going to do with it? And I was like, well, I don't know. What am I going to do? Like, you know, I guess, I guess I'll just have a spare weapon all the time now that yeah. I hate, you know, I hate using this, this short sword that I have to carry with me because, you know, because we walk through, through so many narrow pathways. Sure. You know, like it just, I feel like they're like, you know, you don't need, you know, just don't worry about that. Cause then it, yeah, it's just overcomplicates things, makes it boring and it might create resentment from your players because you're just sure. giving them more obstacles. Yeah, try not to make your players regret their decisions when making characters mm-hmm. unless you are spending, I would say, at least twice as much time making them proud of their choices. Sure, yeah. It's fine yeah. to, like, once in a while be like, 
Well, you shouldn't have chosen to use a two-handed weapon when you're now in a situation where a one-handed weapon and a shield would have been better. Once in a while, that's fine. It's fine to make them realize the sacrifices they have made. However, if it gets to the point where they're like, well, now I, I guess I just can't use my preferred weapon anymore because it's become an issue so many times, that's when it's become a problem. Yeah. So like I was saying, like, you know, do it if you think it's going to make the game more fun. But watch out because it might it might be the exact opposite. It might just make people really frustrated with how you're running the game. Because, mm-hmm. like, it's a fantasy. If you want to play a character that wields a weapon that's 12 feet long or whatever, fine. If, 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 that, if that makes the game more fun for you, cool. I don't want to stop you. And I don't think other DMs should necessarily try to stop you. However, make it meaningful. You know, have there be times where it's a disadvantage, have there be times where it's an advantage. Right. All right. I think that'll do it for our regular questions for today, but we do still have our social media questions. Our last social media question was, what is your favorite deity, oath, or patron? Uh, Do you recall what your answer was, Jeff? Mm, I can't remember if I said what I said, if I said anything. (laughs) <laughs> I probably said I would try to come up with a better answer and I didn't. I think I might have said Thurisdan. I like I like the idea of Thurisdan um as a great old one patron. Mm-hmm. Um for anybody not familiar with Thurisdan, Thurisdan is the is a god who was so evil, so powerful and so crazy that all of the other gods banded together to imprison him. Right. And so he works as a patron because he's not really able to exert much force on the world. He he isn't, he can't act as a standard deity, but he is able to like get messages out to those who are like equally as crazy as him or something like that. So the idea with a great old one patron is that he is this, he is this like eldritch abomination out there. That is, you know, if you were to understand too much of him, you would go insane. And so he's able to give like little bits of his otherworldly power to pay to, to warlocks to, you know, do whatever they want with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I've talked a couple times about the uh, Return of the Temple of Elemental Evil. If I am not mistaken, it's been a long time, there might have been other parts to this, but I believe Thurisdan is is like the big bad behind all of the stuff going on in that, I mm. think. Okay. I always think back to the, like, stat block for Thor in uh, Deities and Demigods. <laughs> sure, that's edition. a pretty good one. Yeah, just like oh, like oh yeah, his hey, the Mjolnir is plus forty, you know, thundering, <laughs> lightning, returning yeah. throughout, you know, you know, it's all the cra- crazy stats. Ev- like every every thirty, 30 levels of cleric, thirty levels of barbarian, thirty levels, you know. Yeah, yeah, Thor's pretty good. Um, all right, so over on Facebook, we just got a couple. Justin H says Loki, because I just love effing with my players. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thor's got something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> He's real Thor about it. Good job. Sean M says, In the past year, I've started playing casters and most recently took on a warlock. I've thoroughly enjoyed the Great Old One as my patron. I'm a lover of Lovecraftian lore. Say that five times fast. I'm a lover of Lovecraftian lore and decided to play it up as though my character was completely unaware of who the patron was. But taking the opportunity to tell the story about how an expelled 26-year-old wizard school student doing his own dark research, had a ritual and then was pulled into a dimension you could not possibly fathom, a la Lovecraft's descriptions. Mm. So he comes out the other side of the portal back into our world, his body 60 years older with interesting powers, no idea which being granted him his power or if that being is even aware of his existence and directly influencing his growth. Lots of role-playing room in not knowing and just doing what fancies him. So there you go. Yeah, I think that's a great... uh, great way to to handle the great old one patron i think i said although i like thurisdan i'm not a huge fan of the great old one patron in specific like specifically Mm -hmm. um i i would i would prefer if i were playing a warlock i would prefer the probably the the fiendish um patron personally sure but i don't know yeah there's, there's lots of cool ways to do it over on Facebook, Alistar the Minotaur says, It's got to be Cord. There's a simplistic beauty to his followers. Strength above all, and all seeking a glorious warrior's death so they can feast and fight in the halls of a fantasy Valhalla longhouse. A fantasy warrior poet society, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> but if anybody's listening, all hail Cthulhu. Because <laughs> Cthulhu. There you go. 
Uh, we did not get anybody on Twitter and on Discord. Dustin has a great answer. Uh, it's a joke answer, but it is a picture of uh, from Order of the Stick, Banjo the Clown. Okay, yeah. <laughs> There's a, a, a short little stint in the Order of the Stick comic where one of the characters realizes that he can multi-class into cleric if he wants to because the party needs more healing or something. And so he invents a deity that is a hand puppet called Banjo oh, right, the Clown. Yep. Yep. That is a, a little clown holding a banjo. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and there's a point a little bit later on where he starts trying to convert others to to join Banjo the Clown. And the party's ranger, the party's chaotic evil ranger, um, latches on to like the destructive properties of Banjo the Clown. And then when when Elan, the, the bard who created the deity, when he starts, you know, changing some of the dogma to not be so violent, uh, the ranger gets really upset because like, that's not the banjo that that I believe in. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag not my banjo. <laughs> there you go. Stillskin Cooper 84 says, I've always loved Bahamut Zero, which uh, I know is a a summon in Final Fantasy VII. Sure. Bahamut specifically is is in many, many Final Fantasy games, if right, not yeah. all of them. Yeah, but in Bahamut is a uh, deity of some sort. Yeah. In 4th edition and 5th edition, Bahamut is one of the good deities in it's the, the counterpart to Tiamat. Right, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's the, it's the good aligned metallic dragon deity. Yeah, but since Jilskin Hoopa 84 has uh, has a great affinity for Final Fantasy and is trying to make, trying to try to get into, you know, a Final Fantasy role playing game, like a uh, tabletop role playing game, I think he is referring to the Final Fantasy version of that. I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, then uh, he also says, also the Raven Queen. I like this interpretation of Morrigan from the Celtic lore mixed with some Selene from Underworld, of course. Um, next up, Henge1981 says, the few times deities came into play, I've used Bahamut. So yeah, again, Bahamut is just, he's a lawful good dragon deity, the platinum dragon, I think. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a, it's a popular choice, popular for paladins and such. Um, Peace Joy Pancake says, we've not used the standard deities until now because homebrew, but I will say when I made my warlock character, I went with Archfey for my patron. I like how it's not so completely clear cut as a demon would be. Are they good? Are they evil? What are their intentions? How will they manipulate the warlock to reach their goals? What even are their goals? We can find out together through play. And yeah, I like that. Um, I really think that when you have a warlock, you should to some extent, explore the connection between the warlock and the, and the patron. Mm -hmm. Um, the beverage tea says Lolf, no reason other than she is pretty awesome. Two of my players tend to play male drow as regular, unaffected by the sun, not aware of social reactions, not aware of drow history or social structure characters. (laughs) It annoys me to no end, but I keep my annoyance to myself because they like the edgy feel and they don't have the time to really delve into the lore. I'd rather play with them even with their off-brand drow characters than stand on the source books in self-righteousness. But I do like imagining plots where Lolth sends out female drow bounty hunters to slap some know-thyself sense into them. (laughs) There you go. Um, I've never been a huge fan of drow myself, but I could definitely... They have a lot of lore to... You know, Lolth has a lot of lore to pull from. Yeah. So that could definitely uh, appeal to some people. Um, Zadig69 says, I think the silver flame from Eberron is my favorite deity or religion. Oh. It's so unique and interesting to me. Yeah, that was, that one was pretty, was pretty neat for sure. Yeah. Um, and that is, uh, it's an Eberron deity that is represented by like a, a, you know, a giant silver flame that actually exists. You can go see the silver flame in the country of Thrain, which is actually where our Roll20 game is currently taking place. Hmm. Um, and... If I'm not mistaken, it's like totally lawful good. It's all about, you know, fighting evil, fighting demons. But there is like some some aspect in there that like the flame itself actually contains a demon that was trapped a long time ago. And so there are some people who follow the sacred flame that end up getting like enticed by this hidden evil and split off into their own, you know, yeah splinter cells or whatever right but uh, anyway um autumn wind on discord says io 
I loved playing Sasha the Dragonborn Paladin of Io. My party, of course, could not pronounce the name in my native tongue. My GM let me play a paladin that worships a dead god. Io was the dragon god that was cut in half that became both Bahamut and Tiamat. Io is all alignments, so I encouraged people to follow their true nature and was treated by followers of Bahamut as a heretical cultist, but somewhat tolerated as I considered misguided rather than evil. Spoilers for Tomb of Annihilation, I may have been going to be the cause of the party's doom. We found the tomb, my paladin's aura gave the party a hefty bonus to saves, so none of my party was possessed by the trickster gods. Therefore, we probably would not have been able to defeat the big bad at the heart of the tomb. But alas, scheduling conflicts won out, and we never got to the impending TPK. Shucks. (laughs) Oh, darn. Yep. Um, And then just one more. uh, Joe S. says, My favorite is the Great Old One as a Warlock patron. I picture them as a higher dimensional being. The physics of this world absolutely have no meaning to them. They don't consider life to be real and have no issue snuffing it out any more than we would consider turning off a light to be amoral. They are extremely aloof and view their warlocks as an entertaining distraction, much like we view our characters when playing Skyrim. Our reality isn't a true reality to them. I kind of like that idea, thinking of great old ones. Actually, okay, let me finish my thought, and then I have an idea. I like the idea of of thinking of great old ones as being so disconnected from the world that... Like, nothing is of any actual consequence to them. They might as well just be playing a video game. Hmm. And that brings me to my idea, what if a great old one patron was actually the player playing the game? (laughs) Right. You are your own patron. You are your own patron, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Ah, that's that's a bit meta, but I think I think something could be done with that. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, all right, so that was uh, that was our last social media question. Our next social media question is, this is a, a bit of a grab bag question. There's a lot of potential answers to this. What is your favorite aspect of tabletop gaming? Uh, it's a very, very broad question. I just kind of figured let's take it easy this time. It's the table. The table. <laughs> Good job, it's got, Jeff. It's got legs. It's got a surface. Might be made of wood. Who knows? <laughs> um, I mean, it's. I mean, it's always fun to be hanging out with friends and stuff like that. I like yeah. tabletop gaming allows for, like, it, 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 it allows for a good range of like you can get serious about it or you can just be casual about it. Because like, yeah, you can just be like, well, let's. There's a pizza on the table and several drinks and everyone's just kind of ha- hanging around and having a good time. And then like, oh, oh yeah, let's let's fight this demon or whatever. And then you do that and then you make crack some jokes and you know mm-hmm. uh, you know do some role playing in there and there. Or or you know you could have like a whole you know. Uh, uh, you know, set up of terrain and be like super serious about like the tactics of everything. And like, sure. I don't know. I, I feel like, like anybody can find something to like about it. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a great answer. Um, I would probably say my answer would be um, the, the flexibility when you're playing mm-hmm. a, a video game or a computer game, you can only do the things that the computer has programmed. Sure. In D and D. Anything you can think of, I mean, of course, it has to go through the dungeon master, but because there's a dungeon master and not a computer, if you come up with something that the dungeon master didn't plan for, assuming they don't just tell you, no, it doesn't work, do what I had planned, you can do anything. If you come up with an idea that is very unorthodox but could work, right? you can try it. There might yeah. be a chance of failure because, you know, there's dice and whatnot, but anything you can think of is a potential option. I love that. Ever since I first started playing the game, that has always interested me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm interested in seeing what uh, what some of our listeners have to say about that one. Again, it's a pretty broad question, so I I expect a wide range of answers. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that'll do it for our questions for today. But before we before we close out, let's let's relax. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> Let's remember those who have come before us, who have made the world a better place at the expense of their own lives, as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. I hope we haven't already... I don't think we've done this one. If we have, correct me, and I'll find another one. 
Mm. Today's funeral pyre was submitted by Nespin F on Reddit, and it goes as follows. A character who was somewhat mad, winning the scramble to free an Afridi and thus claim a wish from it. He wished to be a dragon and became a dragon. Egg. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Did hatch eventually, but by then he was an NPC. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. When, I, I guess, you should try to <laughs> be careful with your wishes. I, I know I do... Uh, I do criticize DMs who are a bit too twist heavy with their 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 wish granting. However, when it's coming, when you're wishing from an Afridi, you know you kind of gotta you gotta right. be careful with that. Sure. <laughs> so so yeah. Um. So I guess let's raise a glass in memory of the uh, the this unnamed character who answers the question of which came first, the dragon or the egg. <laughs> Clink. Clink. All right, that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. You can join the discussion on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Reddit, we're on our Interparty Discord, we're on Twitter at InPartyConflict. We've got weekly social media questions, so if you answer them, your answers might end up on the show. Find us on the podcatcher of your choice, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you download podcasts. Please leave us a rating, a review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where you can uh, watch videos of us playing video games. Yes. Speaking of video games, check out my side project, the Arcade Memories Podcast. If you'd like to submit your own childhood memories of going to the arcade, you can send them to me at arcadememoriespodcast at gmail.com. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show. What you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time, don't let the door hit you where the giant sword splits you.